14 days, three hours. <laughs> and I've enjoyed every single moment of it, and mostly because of what just happened. Because Associate Dean Klaus Schubert, I beat your butt. <laughs> Next year will be different. Next year will be different. But all I wanted was to meet Matt. But I do have to give a couple of thanks out to an incredible support staff that, that helped decorate. That included my administrative assistants, Edward and Danielle, as well as the work study students. And most importantly, some of my own students in my history class and in my humanities class who came in and dressed up like corpses and people who were massacred and, and all that other stuff. So I thank them for that. One of my favorite events here at BC is Halloween, which is kind of strange considering that as a child, I was very introverted. I didn't like showing up at parties or especially in costume, and you would never have gotten me to dress up and go trick or treating as Halloween. Anybody else like that in here? So your question should be, right, Dr. Nieves, what happened? Because now, at the age of 50, um, <laughs> I celebrate this like crazy. I haven't even bought candy yet in the neighborhood, but I think the lights will be off tonight. And, but one of the very best parts is because I am a professor at BC. And with such a diverse population of students and with such a diverse population of faculty, I get to enjoy and bring together my love for the humanities, Bring my love for the arts, bring my love for Halloween, bring my love for history, bring my love for science and biology, and yes, math, I do like it. I didn't say love, but I do like it. And things like this that will help you learn a little bit more about what it is to be human, as well as what it is to know your science, your history, etc. Because all of it, as you mature, you're going to see, is about patterns and about rhythm. And as Roman in here in the front who can tell you, I focus on my classes on what? On patterns. Forget memorization, forget names and dates and events because they're not that important. They're in your phone. So today is a special occasion because I get to work with one of my work wives here at South Campus, Dr. Janelle Orridge. <laughs> biology and I just found this out recently that you're only a biologist because I always thought she was a botanist and an ethnobotanist and a whole lot of other degrees that you have. But she's actually a really good biologist, good biologist who focused on what's your this ecology and evolution. And evolution. Yes. And so today the whole point of today's event is to focus on the myths and the legends of Halloween. As a historian, I can tell you that whenever we have myths and legends, they're usually based on some sort of reality. And I'm not here to tell you that there are zombies out there, some of them are in my class, but that's okay. <laughs> there, that there aren't werewolves and that there aren't vampires. But I am here to tell you, and Dr. Orange is here to support me on this, that that is all based on tradition and history and science. And so today's presentation is divided into two parts. We have my part, which is the historical perspective, where we're going to be talking about the myths and lores of the past. Is there some truth to a lot of this myth? We're going to talk a little bit about vampires, werewolves, and zombies specifically. And then the social history of medicine and how all this wraps around the concept of fear. Dr. Orridge. Okay, so. What I will be covering is the biological aspects behind why we may feel that certain organisms or human beings, specifically, could fall into those vampire, werewolves, and zombie categories. So what we're going to notice is that there are two ways that these creatures could have developed. It's going to be divided into mutations in your DNA or the presence of a virus. So I'm going to explain what your DNA is, what a virus is, and then show how in these different creatures it is possible to think that a human is one of them. Okay? And to understand this, other than the science, you need to kind of, and if you're here to take notes, please do so, take pictures, whatever you need to do. 
you need to understand that there's a difference among the three terms that are up there. Myth, legend, and lore. And these are typical Webster dictionary definitions. Take a picture so that you understand what it is that you're celebrating here at Halloween or what kids are actually doing because you hear a lot of different stories out in the neighborhood as to why I celebrate Halloween, why I don't celebrate Halloween. And first and foremost, we have the myth. And myths go back in time for as long as human beings have dreamt and have imagined and have told stories. And a myth is nothing more than a traditional or legendary story with or without a determinable basis on fact or natural explanation, and especially is used to try to explain the things that sometimes we just cannot understand. So far so good? That's a myth. Some myths continue, most myths die out, or they change. A legend, a non-historical or unverifiable, you can't prove it, you can't disprove it. Right? Story handed down by tradition from earlier times and popularly accepted as historic. So, a really good example of that, Dracula. That's a legend. And then you have lore, which is the body of knowledge, the literature, the photographs, the, the, the videotapes of uh, Sasquatch or Rolando the Private, the pirate king and his wife that he just found yesterday, right? Um, all of that is, all those stories are what we consider lore. And so as you're listening to us and as you have your questions and you take notes, please feel free to ask, feel free to think out loud, feel free to understand what is a myth, what is a legend, what is a lore. And the truth is, if we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll just make it up. Okay? Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. All right, so as I earlier stated, these individuals could arise due to either a mutation or a virus. I'm sorry, but I need it. I need control. Okay. Yes, dear. <laughs> so within your cells, each of your cells in your body has genetic material, and this is what your DNA is. And if we were to unravel the DNA that is within your cells, what we will see is that there are certain segments within your DNA that are known as genes. And your genes are what code for what you look like. So your genes are going to produce proteins that give you your skin color, that give you your hair color, even how tall you are. So anything that changes from that original sequence is going to be referred to as a mutation. So something you are familiar with is sickle cell disease. Yes? Yes. All right. So sickle cell disease is the disease of the blood, meaning that instead of your normal red blood cells becoming that normal circular shape, it becomes sickle cell or that J shape. The reason being is that when your DNA is producing your proteins, there is what is known as the primary structure. So my students that are here, make some noise. All right. So all of you, this should sound familiar to you. Okay, so your proteins are composed of amino acids. So within your DNA sequence, there are three base pairs known as your codons. So this is where we see the C, T, and T. That genetic information will thereby turn into messenger RNA. We will learn that next Tuesday, okay? After that, that turns into an amino acid glucine, and that helps to produce that normal shape of your red blood cell. However, if something goes wrong. Oh, God. Something's wrong. <laughs> It was a hurricane. If something goes wrong, you look like that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so say the middle base changed from a T to an A. That will change the amino acid that is produced. If that changes, then the whole entire structure of your protein will change. And in the case of sickle cell anemia, that red blood cell is not perfectly round anymore. It is that sickle shape. 
And what is so detrimental about that is they can hook onto one another and start causing blood clots. So that is one of the symptoms of sickle cell anemia. So the other way will be via viruses. Now, a lot of students confuse viruses with bacteria. One is alive, one is not. Which one is alive? Because my students are awesome, all right? So, bacteria are alive. Yes, I see you, Nia. Okay, so bacteria are alive, viruses are not. What they do have in common, they do cause diseases. They both have genetic material, but viruses need to hijack a host cell before they can make more of themselves. Bacteria, they have all the machinery they need to make more of themselves, thereby they are alive. Viruses are not. Okay, Boo. Thanks, Boo. <laughs> Vampires are our first creature that we're going to be talking about. And for whatever reason, here in the United States and across the world, vampires have become incredibly popular. We have vampire movies, vampire books. There's a huge thirst for vampires and vampire stories that we see in different examples, whether you've read the historian, whether you were a fan of True Blood the way I was, whether you watched the originals or, or read any of these other books by Anne Rice. What is it about vampires that make us love them? Even though we know what they stand for, and even though we know their history, why do we love them so much? Why do we crave to learn about vampires so much? And a lot of it has to go back to the 15th century. Everybody knows this guy. He's the original Dracula. His name is Vladimir, okay? But he's not known as Vladimir the Vampire or Vladimir Dracula. He's known as Vladimir the Impaler. And he's a true, and he's a real historical person. Okay? And if you wanted to go to Romania, and to the, I think it's the city of Transylvania, you can go to his castle, you can find out how Vlad the Impaler, when he was 10 years old as a prince, would throw some of his friends, as well as dogs, cats, and other animals out the window so that they could be impaled onto the big spikes of the fence outside the, um, the castle. And that's how he eventually got his name. But, that, but the vampire myth doesn't necessarily come from him. He's a very important part of it, but his cruelty, his brutality, the mess that he made in the city and the towns and the suburbs of Transylvania are what be eventually became the backbone of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And if you've never written, or I mean, you've never read Bram Stoker's Dracula, do. Because every movie that you watch called Dracula is based on that particular book. In Romania, and this is the weird part that many of my students don't understand, he wasn't the vampire. He was the hero of independence. He was the one who fought against the Ottoman Empire when the Arabs and the Muslims were coming into uh, Europe in that part. And then all of a sudden, this becomes a legend. And as a legend, these vampires enter into cultural being, into cultural existence, into becoming cultural entities, became a global phenomenon. And again, the question in the back of your mind as a historian or as a biologist or as a chemist or a thinker should be how does something so unreal become what? A legend. Very good. A legend. Who said that? An extra point in your biology, please. Do I have that right? Do I have that authority? Good job, Valeria. Okay. That didn't be extra credit. Anthropologist Paul Barber. Now, Paul Barber, for those of you who don't know what an anthropologist does, studies human culture, studies the things that human beings do, whether as ethnicities or tribes or populations, etc. And what he said was that nearly every single culture has some form of a vampire. Every single culture. Not the ones from the movies, and almost all of those versions bear surprising similarities to what we recognize when we go to the movies. That being said, this belief in vampires stems from superstition as well as, and this is the part that Dr. Orange is going to talk about a little later, mistaken assumptions about what we thought happened after we died and we were in the ground. 
Some of the things you've heard that when we're dead and in the ground, our nails keep growing. Some of the things that you've heard is that our hair keeps growing for a while. And those are all misassumptions, mis that word? Incorrect assumptions that go back to the Middle Ages because the one thing that all these vampires had in common, regardless of where they were, was one that they explained or tried to explain an unexplained future. That if somebody's body underground is continuing to grow, that means something for the family. That means that perhaps somebody did something wrong. That maybe mom or wife or your pirate king husband did something that he should not have done. Second, blame it on either good or evil. And you're talking about the Middle Ages, right? Where everything was explained according to what? What our word? Religion. Everything was religious. It was humanity's way of trying to explain what we do not know how to explain. And third, the dead, let's face it, they're easy to blame. They're not going to complain. So we use them as scapegoats. And that's how that vampire myth starts to come about. Villagers, they not only misunderstand these unexplained phenomena, but they also fear death. And most of us here, and I've had this discussion, as Roman can tell you in my humanities class, on the question of death. Why do we fear death so much, especially in Western civilization? And a lot of it has to do with us not knowing what's next. Us not knowing what happened. What, what if everything I believed in for the last 70, 80, 90 years is incorrect? And that causes fear. Graves, therefore, were unearthed, thinking that the recently dead were responsible for the bad luck that I was getting in my family. And they often mistook ordinary decomposition processes with supernatural phenomena. Let's, let's face it, they didn't understand science the way we stand, understand it now. In the winter months, decay would slow down. But in summer months, what would happen to a dead body? What do you think? Anybody ever leave chicken out a little too long on the kitchen counter? Uh, right? It, what happens? It decomposes. It starts to stink, and it takes sometimes days to get rid of that, that scent, right? Intestinal decomposition also created bloating, which forced the blood to the mouth, and so as these stomachs extended, all that blood would come out, and it would look for a lot of people that this guy left the grave in the middle of the night, went hunting, and bit into something. And what else, how else would you explain a dead corpse with blood on the teeth. And third, though we understand this in the 21st century, the medieval mind saw it as sure signs, completely, positively, absolutely sure, that vampires were real and existed among us. They didn't need much other proof. After all, they had been studying about the devil, they had been studying about demons, and on top of that, they were using religion to explain science. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's where I come in, because what do these figures look like? Nia, what are we talking about? Thank you. Okay, so, vampire. I know every single student's name, okay? That's one freaky talent I got, all right? So, porphyria. Porphyria is a rare disease in which chemical substances called peripherins accumulate within the blood of an, a human being. And what that happens is it changes the production of those same red blood cells that I spoke about earlier. Okay, so individuals that have this disease, okay, there are actually eight different types of porphyria. And it's because there's eight different steps in the folding of the protein hemoglobin. So any step can get a mutation that will create this disease. So some symptoms that someone with porphyria would have is extreme photosensitivity, meaning if you were to go out in the sun, you will start to blister, it will start to hurt. It's very extreme sunburn. So this is where you get that what is it called? Which one? Myth? Legend? Lore? I wasn't paying attention, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, boo. Is it myth? Okay, so that's where we get the myth 
that vampires don't like to go out in the sun. Okay, another symptom is erythrodontia. Okay, so anytime you hear erythro, that's actually referring to your red blood cells. So erythrodontia is when you have the red discoloration of the teeth. So you, if you have red teeth, you're going to assume that that person is drinking blood. In addition, that constant exposure to sunlight will lead to your gums receding. It will lead to your eyelids shrinking. So these, again, give you some of those characteristics of what a vampire looks like. Because if your gums are receding, your lips are receding, you're going to expose your fangs. Also, a person with porphyria, if they were to pee and give a blood, uh, sorry, a urine sample, if you leave the urine out for a period of time, it actually turns reddish purple. So this is here where we see that myth that vampires drink blood. Because if you're peeing blood, you must have imbibed blood. And correct, and question, those, that picture was of a live person. This is a live person. <laughs> so another condition, catalepsy, okay, is associated with epilepsy and schizophrenia. So sometimes an individual will have a bout in which they pass out. Their breathing slows very, slows very, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, your muscles become rigid, so it looks like you're dead. Your heart rate and respiration slow down, as I stated, and you can be mistaken for a corpse. Now, if you think about how individuals were buried back in the day, a coffin, correct me if I'm wrong, though, Okay, how recent is the actual burying of individuals in coffins? Did I stump you? Did. Oh, okay. Well, being buried in coffins is a more recent thing. <coughs> Meaning, in the old days, they probably dig the hole, they place the body in it, and covered it up. So if a person was buried in this condition, okay, it may be assumed that once they came to, once they came out of this physical condition, they were able to dig themselves out, and then it would look like they are the living dead. Because we buried this person, because we thought he was safe, he or she was dead, and if they're coming out, they are the living dead. Okay? Werewolves are our second group of uh, entities. And if you were watching True Blood, almost everybody's favorite character was the main werewolf. I forget his name right now. One that's met who? There you go. Okay. Um, and this process, this act of becoming a werewolf, this idea of being of, of transforming completely, has a scientific name, like anthropy. Lycos or lichens uh, from wolf and anthropos from the Greek. I see that Dr. Kupalis just left. But anthropos means man, means man. So a man wolf, a wolf man. And sometimes that's what they were called man wolves, not just werewolves. Traditionally, we believed, thanks to legend and thanks to myth, that this was caused by five different things. Number one, being cursed by someone who maybe you hurt, who maybe you cheated on, who maybe you did something wrong to, right? Being conceived under a new moon, so no sex but under a new moon, if you don't want to wear both children. <laughs> Eating certain herbs that might be too bitter. Or sleeping under a full moon on a Friday. You don't want to go camping in the middle of the night on a full moon. And finally, drinking water that happens to be touched by a wolf. And again, these are not stupid ideas, right? In the 21st century, these don't make sense to us, I hope, right? But we don't judge them. Can anybody tell me why we don't judge them? You gotta go back 400, 500 years for this. They didn't know better, right? This is the science of their time. And when we judge the past based upon what we know now, based upon what Dr. Orridge is teaching you, 
Anybody know what we call that moment? Do you remember the word? It's called presentism, where we judge the past based upon what we know today, which is completely and utterly unfair to people in the past. What's the word? Presentism. But werewolves also have an ancient history, much more ancient than even the vampires. According to folklorist Carol Rose, in her book, Giants, Monsters, and Dragons, she discusses how the ancient Greeks even believed that a person could be transformed if he or she ate wolf meat that was mixed with human flesh. Yummy. Just mix a little bit of wolf, mix a little bit of a person, and you can easily become a werewolf, and that condition then is irreversible. Other kinds of werewolves included other shapes. The Scots have a similar story about Selkies. Selkies, who in this particular case are not mermaids, but they're a little bit different, right? Are creatures who spend their lives in the cold ocean as seals, but change into human beings. An ancient Scottish myth. And this idea of the werewolf, sorry, most often associated with the moon. As you saw, two of the different reasons for how somebody could become uh, a werewolf was based upon what? The moon, which is where we get the word lunacy or lunatic or acting in a lunatic, lunatic manner. So do the math, metaphorically speaking, and you see that everything is connected. The bacterial revolution, which as a historian of science is one of my favorite topics, is when we finally discover germs, viruses, and bacteria. All that stuff that you're learning in Dr. Orridge's class, that is only as recent as 1860, 1870s at the earliest. Prior to that, we had no idea that bacteria, viruses, and germs actually existed. And so you're, if you're in my history class, right, Diana, you know that Diseases were always being blamed on God or on the demons or on curses, etc., until Edward Jenner and Robert Koch discovered that germs, bacteria, and viruses are what cause cholera, what cause smallpox, etc. And that bacteriological revolution has shown us that several medical conditions that we've always thought were part of the human uh, species can mimic the appearance of a werewolf and may have contributed to the early belief in their existence. Example, hypertrichosis. Hyper, the prefix meaning what? Too much or many. The opposite would be what? Here's the quiz. Hypo, right? Hypertrichosis, unusually long hair on the face and body. And that's a real person. That's a real person from the 19th century. And porphyria, what Dr. Orange also just finished talking about, the extreme, extreme sensitivity to light, extreme uh, exposure to seizures, anxiety, as well as other light-sensitive factors. People suffering, suffering from these were easy scapegoats because who, why not blame somebody who's just too hairy? And they helped prove the existence of werewolves. How did this come together with Halloween? This is the part that's interesting for today. According to legend and history, there was a German, A.D. Uh, Schubert, you might know him, Peter Struve, did I say the name correctly? No? Okay, all right. <laughs> Claimed to own a belt of wolf skin, allowing him to change into a wolf whenever he wanted. He could bend, the quotation goes, into a lupine form, his teeth would multiply in his mouth, and he craved human blood. Typical. He claimed, he was boisterous about it, he made it known that he killed a dozen people over a period of 25 years. People got angry with this, people were upset at him about this, etc. So what did they do? They forced him to confess, they tortured him, they eventually decapitated him, and the headless body was burned at the stake just to make sure he was dead. And all of this happened on an October 31st, 1589, which is how Halloween then becomes associated with what? Werewolves. Okay. The truth is that as many people accuse of being werewolves, and unfortunately we probably need to study this more in American history class, 
had just as many people who were uh, accused of being werewolves as they were accused of being witches right here in the state of Massachusetts. That would be an interesting study, right, Diana? Okay, so hypertrichosis is a disease caused by mutation in the genes of the human. So here we have Petrus Gonzalez and the family of Ombres. So Petrus Gonzalez is this individual here, and these are his two daughters who were afflicted with that same disease. So as Dr. Cornejo stated, back then, they didn't know the reason why these individuals were very hairy. So later on, as we discovered, it is actually due to sex-linked inheritance. Okay, so the X chromosome is actually diseased. So if you are a male, you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. If you are a female, you have two X chromosomes. Now, if your X chromosome is afflicted or has the diseased gene or the mutated gene on it, then if you inherit it, then you will actually get that disease. So if we take a look at this pedigree, here we have the affected father. His X chromosome has a white shading where the gene for hypertrichosis is. So, when you see the white, that means that X chromosome is affected. When you see a shaded X, that X is normal. So what we're doing, we're crossing a normal mother with a diseased father. Are we good to this point? Yep. Awesome. So now let's see when they have babies, who will be affected? Will it be the sons or will it be the daughters? So, here we go. I'll actually move to this side. So, if the mother can only give a normal X chromosome and the father gives the Y to make the son, then the son will not have hypertrichosis. If the father gives his X, to the Y, by, I'm sorry, to the X of the mother. By the way, boys, sorry, men, you are the determining factor of the child sex. Because you have, oh, we have some applause in the black. Okay, so, if you are male, you have two sex chromosomes. You have the X or the Y. The female can only give an X. So it is your sperm that determines the sex of Oh, Emilio. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, so here we have a daughter. But if the daughter inherits that disease X, she is going to have hypertrichosis. So that's why the daughters of Petrus Gonzalez had hypertrichosis. Okay, just going along, if we have a mother with an affected father, again, he has that normal X chromosome, he will not have the disease. Again, if you have another daughter, he will, she will have the X from the father, the X from the mother, and because it is a dominant trait, she will have hypertrichosis. So, hypertrichosis, a genetic disorder linked to the X chromosome that caused people to grow very thick hair over their body. Now, it can be divided into local versus generalized hypertrichosis. Local meaning that you have distinct patches over certain areas of your body, whereas generalized, it takes over your entire body. You can have congenital or acquired. Congenital means that you are born with it. So that X chromosome was passed down from your father, you inherited it, you got the disease. However, there are certain chemicals that are within drugs you may be taking, like pharmaceutical drugs, even radiation that can trigger your X chromosome to have mutations in it that will cause you to gain hypertrichosis later on in life. And that is what acquired means. Now, some ways to treat it will include bleaching, but that's a lot of bleach, okay? You can try to cut it, but it grows very quickly. You can shave, you can pluck, you can wax. All of those are temporary. 
But what they did discover was a new drug called topical ethlornithine. And what that does, it works with the base of the hair follicle. There are proteins that allow your hair to grow, keratin. But if you place this ethlornithine at the base of the follicle, it is an enzyme that prevents hair growth. So this is more effective in the overall treatment versus the cosmetic weight or cosmetic breath. And the last character or creature that we're going to be talking about is probably the one that's gotten the most popularity in recent movies. Are the zombies. How many of you have ever watched a zombie movie? A lot of zombie series. A zombie story. How many of you are ready for the zombie apocalypse? How many of you know what to do in case of a zombie apocalypse? And the interesting thing is, because there are about 15 people who just raised their hand. There are two things that you're going to learn by the end of this. One is the thing that I'm about to tell you now, and that is the United States federal government actually has an entire office focused on the, zo the zombie apocalypse. Meaning, they know it's not real. Right? But it's a way to teach people how to do, what to do in case of catastrophe. Whether it's disease, whether it's war, whether it's what they call it the office of the zombie apocalypse. And the second thing that you're going to learn is that these zombies can be killed, according to Dr. Orange. And the zombies come from this complicated myth. This one is the most complicated of all because we love the ideas of zombies existing, but we're scared pantless of them. And a lot of that has to do with our very fear of death. As complicated myths, they're as old as history, but they really have picked up a lot in terms of popularity recently because of government plans, because of Hollywood, because of all the books, television series, etc. And for all of you who watch The Walking Dead, you know what it's all about. The epitome, they are the epitome, the very representation of what we as human beings fear the most. And that usually sinks our hearts. Why are we so afraid of death? Who do we blame for this fear? What is it like to be dead? Right? They are the creatures that get stuck in death, unable to move on to the afterlife, therefore wandering the earth. And writing about zombies goes back as far as the writing of Gilgamesh. And if you've taken Humanities or HUM 1020 with me, it's one of the very th first things you read for me in class the epic of Gilgamesh, the very first attempt in Western civilization to understand the difference between what is living and what is dead. What is the life, what is life, and what is the afterlife, okay? Dhabi, in the 20th century, were very much related to or referred to uh, the country of Haiti and one of its religious traditions, Voodoo, or Voodoo, as we tend to call it here. And many versions of these zombies go back to the folklore of that Guru religion, which is a syncretic religion that combines the religious practices of Africa, beliefs in Yedema, Chango, Ochun, etc., and combining them with the saints and the holy folks of Catholicism. Voodoo expert, and yes, you can become a Voodoo expert, Amy Willis wrote in her New York Times article that the only escape from the sugar plantations during the time of slavery in Haiti was sometimes death. Which has seen as a return, which was seen as a return to Africa or the Languine. The zombie, therefore, is a dead person who cannot get across to Languine because the distance is so far. So to become a zombie was a slave's worst nightmare. To be dead and to still be a slave, to be an eternal ill. And so that myth, that legend, that lore starts to build up as time goes on and as these slaves in the Haitian plantations that were colonized by France, they start to look at zombies as a natural, normal part of their existence. The origin of the concept of zombieism stems from this Haitian voodoo culture, the spirit of the dead, as we would say in Haitian prayer. The Bokor, the voodoo priest, who possessed the ability to resurrect the deceased through the administration of the Kupadre, 
a powder, the primary ingredient of which is tetradoxin, the deadly substance of a poisonous fish, the fufu, which is a porcupine fish. According to legend, a zombie is someone who has annoyed his family, we have all, we all have one of those, and community to the degree that they can no longer stand to live with this person. That's because I got you. They respond to hiring a bokor. And this bokor, then his job, I would assume her job too, because they can't be with it, is to turn that person into a zombie to walk, to walk the face of the earth for all eternity. Our biggest fear. Once issued, this kupadre would appear to die and therefore treat it, and therefore he would be treated as dead. The heart rate slowed to a near stop. Breathing patterns would also practically stop. Body temperature would significantly decrease. So as this process is going through, the body is getting closer and closer to the coldness of what? Death. The public would then bury him, as if he would be a dead person or a corpse. The Bokor later would then exhume, dig out the body. Physicality would remain because the body is still there, it's an actual corpse. The memory, everything that he remembers, everything he lived, everything he felt, everything he sensed, every relative he had would be erased and would be transformed into a mindless drone. And fourth, those still living, they would remain under the Bokor's power until the Bokor dies. Sound familiar? Okay. In ancient times, thanks to Gilgamesh and, and Mesopotamia, this zombie-like behavior was described. And even the epic of Gilgamesh says, if you don't know who actually wrote this, wrote, when the dead will go up to eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. Can you imagine going back 4,000 years and being told by priests and scholars the most educated and most professional people of Mesopotamian civilization, that this was not a possibility. This was an eventuality. And as an, as an illiterate person, what do you do? You believe it, because why would smart people lie to us? And so this idea starts to come up. China has also legends of zombies. These are two Chinese forces, right? The undead there are known as Jiangxi, who may have informed our idea of the stiff-limbed, grunty things with greenish white skin that slowly come after you, because you know you can always outrun them. They kill people in order to absorb their ki, their life essence, and it's not just about eating the brains. It's this assumption that a zombie takes your entire soul. In Scandinavia, Zombies have this in them. The same scenario can be seen in this 8th century Norse mythology of the Drow. Rise up from the dead, they guard whatever treasures there might be in the grave. They possess superhuman strength. They kill their victims by devouring, devouring them whole. Scandinavia. And you have the English Revenants. There was a movie a couple of years ago with um, Leonardo DiCaprio called The Revenant which is a lot about this. The 12th century England, William of Newburgh warned of revenants. People, the word revenant come, means comes back. Of corpses that come out of their graves to greet us, to eat us, etc. And so once all of this goes into writing, what happens? When you put anything in writing, it didn't happen on Facebook, what? It didn't happen, right? Well, books used to be the old Facebook. These things that you would open up and whatever was written in them, because people who commanded the word, who knew how to write, had control of what you believe. And a lot of this has to do with one simple thing, the history of fear, which is something I love to say. The real currency at play in studying zombies or werewolves or vampires is fear. The one emotion we know we all have. We all experience it at some point or another, whether it's economic, whether it's political, whether it's social, whether it's religious, and yet it scares the bejesus out of us because we don't know how to explain it. And the best way to explain fear is by what? Blaming it on something we may not understand. And the fear will never die. That is part of our human condition. It's a prime emotion, right? It gives us the ability to survive things, 
It gives us the instinct to run away from things, and it gives us protection. When we feel something in our gut and we're afraid, what's the first thing we do? Unless you're that moron in the movie who goes like, somebody there? Right? No, you run, run the other way, right? Because it's always a matter of fact, I die. Right? <laughs> and so, we just did it, just laugh like that. That's so cool. All right? But it is what makes our imagination go wild. And if you look at some of the most popular movies in Hollywood, all of it is based on what? Our emotional connection. Fear. Without it, we're not human. We don't like it, and how many of you are going to go at least watch one horror flick over the next month or so? How many of you are horror flick fans? Why? Why? It's exciting. Give another reason. Yes. It's funny. Okay. It's funny when well. When they mess up, right? Go what else? It's what? The adrenaline rush. I'll give you an example. Yesterday you may have seen me walking around on campus and I was an evil joker, mask and all, red and black. How many of you saw me? I didn't say a word. I just walked around and there was one woman in admissions who ran so fast. <laughs> her name is Power. I don't know her last name. But she ran so fast. And so it's this fear when we're thinking about history and biology that we have to worry about. Dr. Okay. Orton. Okay, so as you can see in this relationship, he likes to talk. So because in interest of time, I will be succinct. So this is where we bring the viruses into play. Because if you've ever watched The Walking Dead, what are the two ways that individuals can turn into zombies? Virus. By being bitten or? Huh? Dying. OK, so when an individual died, then the virus that was inside of their body became awake. Okay, so I'm going to explain what that means. So, very quickly, the way a virus works, on the outside of the virus, there are what are known as receptors. These receptors are specific to the cell that it wants to infect. So if you think of labels, the virus will have one half, the, the, help, the, sorry, the cell that it wants to infect has the other matching piece. So once it attaches, it then goes into its host cell and deliver all the contents that was once in the virus. That content allows for the reproduction of the genetic material and any of the proteins that the virus needs to survive once it breaks out of the cell. Once it breaks out of the cell, that is when those cells lice or die. So, rabies is an example of a virus that can be inflicted if you are bitten by an animal that has it within its saliva. So this is how the disease gets into the human. And some symptoms associated with rabies is paralysis, anxiety, insomnia, hallucin um, hallucination, hydrophobia, scared of water, don't want to take a bath, you are dirty, and that is what zombies look like. So now, if we get a neuron-specific virus, so your brain, your brain is made up of neurons. So if we have a virus that has the specific receptor to attack the brain cells, your neurons, this is where we start affecting the behavior of the human. Okay, so we have different lobes that are found in your brain that are responsible for different behaviors. So your frontal lobe, your frontal lobe is responsible for all of these. So some of your motor function, your personality, problem solving, your parietal lobe. Your parietal lobe is responsible for sensory information, color, heat, etc. Your occipital lobe, that deals with your vision, your temporal lobe, your hearing, language, and speech. And lastly, your cerebellum, which is towards the base of your brain, is responsible for coordination and movement. So if we get a virus that makes its way to your brain and starts affecting different regions of the brain, this is where we get those different traits. So this is where you get that zombie stagger. They're unable to keep straight. So if the virus makes its way to the cerebellum and starts eating away, killing those cells, 
you're going to affect how balanced or coordinated you are. Okay, it can get to an area in your brain known as the hypothalamus that controls hunger. So normal people, when we eat, we eat to we're full. However, if the hypothalamus is affected by this virus, then you are continuously hungry. You're continuously going to run it, not run because they can't run it. They continuously go after individuals to consume them. Zombie rage, you have a pea-sized organ known as the amygdala in your brain that is responsible for anger. So if you have a virus that attacks that specific region, you will always be angry because normal people are able to turn happy again after the situation passes. And then we know zombies are stupid, okay? You can, they can be coming after you, you step aside, and they just continue walking. So if the virus is affecting that frontal lobe, problem solving, they cannot problem solve, and thereby, that is their stupidity. Okay, so I'm just gonna rush through the rest of these because I just summed that up. And the main way that you kill a zombie, cut off the head, attack the neck, because once you cut off connection to that brain stem that is at the base of your head, you kill all communication of the neurons in your brain all the way to the rest of the body, and that's how they remain dead. So, in that case, are you ready for the zombie attack? So, thank you all for attending. I hope you see the collaboration between the different departments. Here is some of the information that you learned in lecture and how it pertains here. And if you are part of the costume contest, I believe we are going to do that now. Thanks.